Anne and I were leaving on our trip, recreating Eric Severide's route from Canoeing with the Cree, they were almost sorry that we had to paddle it. For the past 32 years, the Mayo Clinic has hosted about a dozen nesting peregrine pairs that have hatched almost 60 offspring. They're mostly native plants that are gonna be beneficial to habitat for pollinators and birds. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Grand Stay Hotels, featuring 35 hotels in eight states and growing. Every guest, every time with Grand Stay. More on the web at grandstayhospitality.com. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open, telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. The Minnesota River spans 330 miles from Ortonville to St. Paul. It's one of the state's major rivers and a tributary of the Mississippi. But unlike the mighty Mississippi or scenic St. Croix, the Minnesota River is considered an afterthought for water recreation, an ugly and polluted river by some critics. But avid paddler Natalie Warren thinks differently. She, along with a friend, paddled the length of the Minnesota as part of a larger paddling voyage in 2011. The Minnesota River is a highly agricultural river, and when Anne and I were leaving on our trip, recreating Eric Severide's route from canoeing with the Cree, people told us that it was the river of chocolate milk, that it was polluted and ugly, and that like they were almost sorry that we had to paddle it as a part of recreating this trip. And we had very low expectations going into it. We were paddling about 1.5 miles an hour, so we got to appreciate every leaf on every tree. And our very first day, we were paddling through a national wildlife refuge. We even had a family of otters come up to our boat and kind of swim around us while we were canoeing upstream. So what we found on the Minnesota River was that aesthetically, it's an extremely beautiful river to paddle. There are all sorts of wildlife and birds and vegetation all along the riverbank. In July, the Prairie Sportsman crew went out with Natalie on a stretch of the river between Mankato and St. Peter to learn more about the recreational opportunities of the river and her obsession with paddling. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, and I went to a small art school for saxophone performance and got completely burnt out when I was 15 because all I did was play saxophone, and so I needed to figure out what kind of other stuff I like to do. And so my friend told me about a YMCA camp called Minogen in a place called Minnesota, which was located in a gray blob in the middle of the country to me at the time and I very impulsively signed up for a two-week Boundary Waters trip and loved it. My first couple nights camping, I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought I heard wolves howling and I was very afraid. So I woke everyone up and it turned out to be the call of the loon. So I was completely out of my element, had no idea where I was. My mom wrote me a letter saying, I hope you're enjoying the beautiful mountains in Minnesota. No one knew where I was, uh, but I fell in love with the Northwoods. I fell in love with first the Boundary Waters and then more urban rivers 
like the Mississippi River and the Minnesota River shortly after that. The Minnesota River is a remnant of the glacial river Warren. So Warren's my last name. So I like to think that it's fate that I have found the Minnesota River. And about 13,000 years ago, Glacial Lake Agassiz um, was formed from the receding glaciers. And that covered a lot of um, basically the Great Lakes area. And there were a couple ice dams that broke. And so the River Warren came out of Glacial Lake Agassiz and in a really short amount of time, tore through what is now the Minnesota River Valley. And so you can see when you're in the valley that the river is just this small part and you have the bluff land. Like the valley itself is actually um, about a mile or two wide in some areas. You can get a perspective here of how large the Glacial River Warren was by looking at that bluff line over there. It's like this whole river valley was carved out by that powerful force of water. And right now, we're just paddling a sliver of that. It is a Minnesota State Water Trail. So the Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota manages the Minnesota River for recreation, for on water recreation. So there are designated campsites along the route that are maintained. So you could very easily do a multi-day trip on the river, just camping and cooking out and paddling day by day, which is a unique experience near the Twin Cities most people think about doing that in the Boundary Waters, but you could drive an hour and a half away from Minneapolis nearby and do like a five day trip on the Minnesota River. It's pretty sweet. 15 years into the sport, Natalie has paddled over 7,000 miles from rivers all across the country and the world. Her most notable trek was one for the record books. In 2011, my friend Ann Rejo and I were the first two women to paddle over 2,000 miles from Minneapolis to Hudson Bay, recreating Eric Severide's route from the book Canoeing with the Cree. So we started at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, paddling upstream during a flood, um, over 330 miles, and then we went downstream on the Red River, up the east shore of Lake Winnipeg, and then took the Arctic Haze River out to York Factory on Hudson Bay. We packed out everything for our entire expedition, to the T, pounds per day, food, and halfway paddling up the Minnesota River, people were running to the riverbank to find us and bring us cupcakes or invite us to dinner. And just were so excited that we were using the river that had been and is such an important part in their lives. They were so excited to share it with us. And that is what I remember most about the Minnesota River. Since their 2,000-mile journey, Natalie has become a tireless river advocate, working to address the problems our Minnesota waterways face, including the Minnesota. We rely on the Minnesota River heavily for agriculture, so the land along the water is used for corn and soybeans, and it's a common practice now to tile fields and so when rain falls onto the ground instead of seeping into the farmland it rushes out to the river so that um, the crops aren't flooded and what happens is that a lot of the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the chemicals that we use on the farmland go directly into the river ultimately i think what we do to the land greatly impacts the water and so 
rethinking how we use the land and what impact it has on the water quality is going to be a very long-term process. But it's a difficult thing, it's very complex. If we knew what to do, we would do it, but there are so many layers to it and so many options. Despite these issues, Natalie believes the river deserves paddlers' attention. It definitely has its problems, and the water quality is not as good as, say, the St. Croix River, where a lot of people go to recreate and boat on a hot summer's day. You don't see that same type of crowd on the Minnesota River, but I do think that it, it really is a hidden gem of a water trail in Minnesota because it's not as crowded and it is absolutely beautiful. You still get those trees and forests and bluffs and twists and turns in the river that you might get on the St. Croix, but you almost feel like you have the river all to yourself. It is a safe place to recreate. It is a beautiful place to recreate. And especially if you're paddling, to be able to float on top of the water and just enjoy the natural scenery and everything around you, it's absolutely gorgeous. Only about one in seven falcons survives to become a breeding adult because they make their living at 200 miles an hour catching prey and it's hazardous. They put together a plan, they picked out all the plants and we got to say, I don't love this or I really love this, can I have more of that? So we did get to tailor it. It's a late May morning and a 21 day old peregrine falcon chick sits alone and content in her nest box while parents Hattie and Orton are off hunting. Little does she know that today, she will be plucked from her safe little home atop the Mayo Building in Rochester. When Jackie Fallon of the Midwest Peregrine Society reaches in to grab the baby chick, Dad returns with a fury. So she is quickly carried down to the Geffen Auditorium. There, an excited room of Mayo Clinic staff and friends watch as the peregrine chick is banded and declared a strong, healthy female. Logan, a Falcon fan from Waterloo, Iowa, draws the name Blizzard from more than 500 entries. So our little female Blizzard was appropriate because she survived this late blizzard. That's why only one egg hatched, because I think we had that storm, late storm. But uh, Hattie hung in there and tried to cover them all as best she could. So that's why it was so special today that we even had one survive. For the past 32 years, the Mayo Clinic has hosted about a dozen nesting peregrine pairs that have hatched almost 60 offspring. It's the fourth year here for Hattie, who is named after a doctor's wife, Hattie Damon Mayo. It's also the fourth for Orton, whose name comes from the town of Ortonville, where rose granite was quarried for the Minneapolis City Hall from which Orton fledged. Hattie and Orton come back every year because it's a great perch for raising chicks and they'll fight to keep it. This spring, Hattie had to fight off five or six females that love this nesting. You know, they know it's a good nesting spot, so she had to fight them off. Sometimes there'll be males that'll come through and he'll, he'll battle too. And I mean, they're, they're designed to kill, so a lot of times it is a fight till the death. Hattie and Orton continue to watch over and protect Blizzard as she grows and her wings develop before taking her first successful flight at 42 days old. In the coming years, she will be looking for her own nesting site. That is, if she survives. Only about one in seven falcons survives to become a breeding adult because they make their living at 200 miles an hour catching prey and it's hazardous. Carol Henderson knows the peregrine falcon well. As the Minnesota DNR's first non-game wildlife supervisor, he and others led the raptors recovery after peregrines disappeared from the upper Midwest in the early 1960s. Before World War II, there were 40 to 50 pairs of nesting peregrines from the shores of Lake Superior to the bluffs of the St. Croix and Mississippi rivers down to Des Moines. After the war, peregrines disappeared within a 20 year span, not only in the upper Midwest. About 300 pairs disappeared from the eastern two thirds of the United States. Marine biologist Rachel Carson attributed the raptor's demise to the agricultural pesticide DDT, which she documented in her book, Silent Spring, published in 1962. In 1965, the International Peregrine Conference in Madison, Wisconsin, drew scientists from around the globe who confirmed Dr. Carson's finding. Because DDT does not break down very rapidly, it was passed up the food chain from insects to small birds to the raptors that ate them. 
and that it caused the females to lay eggs with very thin shells. When the females attempted to incubate their eggs, they broke, which led to wholesale reproductive failure. In Minnesota, the last known nesting pair was seen in 1963. I remember as a, as a child and a teenager, really truly lamenting uh, the fact that the peregrine was gone and I might never see a peregrine falcon. And yet I knew what the peregrine was and what it had been and, and, and that really saddened me. And uh, so I, my whole career and my whole life has been involved with raptors and raptor conservation. Patrick Reddig is a retired professor of avian medicine who founded the University of Minnesota Raptor Center. But the first thing that had to happen before we could even consider restoring the peregrine falcon is that the underlying problem, DDT, had to be eliminated. And that was done in 1972 or 73 by the then newly formed Environmental Protection Agency. In the early 1970s, the first sustained efforts at breeding peregrine falcons in captivity using birds that came from other stocks elsewhere in the western United States and elsewhere in the world actually at Cornell University laid the groundwork for restoring the birds. Peregrines released on the east coast survived and the population started to come back. To replicate that success in Minnesota, Patrick sought help from Carol Henderson, whose non-game program funding had just been boosted by the chickadee checkoff. The Minnesota Tax Form line allows taxpayers to make contributions to the non-game wildlife fund. And I said, we've got money, we can go ahead with helping with bringing back the peregrines. At the same time, Patrick was leading a workshop at the College of Veterinary Medicine in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, when he learned the college was breeding falcons for the Canadian Wildlife Service. But their funding had dried up, and their falcon chicks had nowhere to go. And I said, you know, I think I have an idea. I think something might work here. And I pretty much told them on the spot, we'll, we'll take your production. The following spring, Patrick, Carol, and crew flew up to Saskatoon and picked up five young peregrine falcons that were released at Weaver Dunes on the Mississippi. For 15 years, peregrines continued to be released at Minnesota nesting sites, which eventually expanded to 12 states, as well as Ontario and Manitoba. Public and private partnerships that led to the restoration eventually became the nonprofit Midwest Peregrine Society. Although peregrines were removed from the endangered species list in 1999, the society continues to band, monitor, and maintain a database on peregrine falcons. This is last year in Minnesota, just Minnesota, and they banded 104 young per peregrines. Across the whole Midwest last year, we banded about 255, 260 peregrines. About half of our population is on artificial structures, and I would say of those artificial structures, probably two thirds of them, we've actually put a box or a tray up to help them be more successful. In other places, like under some of the bridges that they nest on and things like that, they just find a, like a triangular gusset between two major structural members and they nest there and they do, do quite well. Folks at the Mayo Clinic hope Hattie and Orton will be back at their nest next spring thrilling anyone lucky enough to spot these majestic predators. In flight, they are the fastest creature on the face of the earth. When you see it, you cannot help but be just wowed by it. And you know, you look at the terminal velocity of a brick falling is 120 miles an hour, give or take. That same two pound peregrine falcon being pulled down by gravity comes down at over 200 miles an hour. And it's because of the streamlining of their body. And it's just complete drag reduction. And they've taken this to the absolute extreme. They are just the epitome of a pursuer in terms of the way that they have, uh, have evolved. And when they're just sitting up at the top of a cliff on a tree, scanning out over a valley like this, you know, they just have a regal bearing about them that you cannot help but notice and appreciate. We owe the peregrine um, a debt of gratitude in the sense that um, they were really the species that brought to the forefront in very dramatic ways how important the environment is and what we were doing to the environment in terms of degrading it that was causing environmental destruction. Uh, it, it was just a dramatic shock when all of a sudden it re was realized that the peregrine falcon was gone. There was a message there about just the impact of human activities on the environment and how even though in its, its, its vastness and its complexities, it's still very vulnerable and we can have negative impacts on it by what we do. Peregrine falcon was the most dramatic because it disappeared completely, but the bald eagle the osprey, the merlin, and the cooper's hawk all sustained severe population reductions as a result of DDT. 
and all of them have recovered. Last spring, the Prairie Sportsman crew climbed atop the Mayo Clinic's Plumber Building to get a good view of the Peregrine Falcon nesting box. What we didn't expect was to hear the 56 bells of one of the largest carillons in North America. Austin Ferguson is only the fourth Mayo Caroloner to play this instrument since it was installed in 1928. Mayo brothers Will and Charles gifted the first 23 bronze bells, which were cast in England, consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and shipped to Rochester. In 1977, another 33 bells were added. They range from 17 pounds to four tons and don't swing. A baton keyboard activates levers and wires attached to clappers that strike the inside of the bells. Every week, Austin plays seven 30-minute concerts of striking melodies that can be heard throughout downtown Rochester. Minnesota is blessed with vast resources of land, water, forest, and grasslands that natural resource managers work hard to protect. But what can you and I do to make a difference? It's called Conservation DIY. Keeping stormwater runoff out of lakes and streams can be expensive, especially in places like Woodbury, one of Minnesota's fastest growing cities. More houses and streets create more surfaces for rainwater to flow from and carry phosphorus into our waterways. This leads to algae growth and polluted waters. To slow down surface runoff, the city of Woodbury has a full arsenal of stormwater ponds, filtration systems, and rain gardens. But the most cost-effective approach is for homeowners to use their own backyards to stop the flow. Woodbury is leading Minnesota in a backyard innovation called a living fence. This mixture of native plants and trees was installed last summer between four adjoining yards in Woodbury's 21 Oaks development. This project is a unique opportunity to try to fix a long-standing problem that's occurred when we have units that are back-to-back -back and the drainage is necessary to go in between lots. What we thought was there was an opportunity to have some aesthetic treatment while providing some privacy and overall solving a problem that's been in existence for many years. The four of us here, we kind of were all a little bit in the same boat. I would say we get the most of the water from all the neighborhoods. Our, the drain is right behind my yard and all four of these lots were really, um, they're just really wet and swampy. So for us, it was a no brainer to be able to filter the water away from our yard and get it down the sewer system and um, really just have something pretty to look at and some privacy for our neighborhood. Woodbury partnered with the South Washington Watershed District to design the living fence and reimburse homeowners for the cost of construction and plants. They put together a plan, they picked out all the plants and we got to say, I don't love this or I really love this, can I have more of that? So we did get to tailor it. We got to add some accent pavers in there and things like that. So we got to have our own voice. Originally, the city had hoped to convince more of Kelly's neighbors to join the project. Some of the other people felt it might take up too much of their yard on the front end. It took about 10 feet of our usable yard space. Um, but I think now that people are seeing it, they're getting more and more interested in the project because it's really beautiful and functional. They're mostly native plants that are gonna be beneficial to habitat for pollinators and birds, bugs, all those kind of things. But it also is gonna reduce the homeowner's need to irrigate while it's cleaning up the water before it runs off the property. Once those roots are able to grow really deep, they're kind of, they create roads for the water to travel down to get deep into the soil base, um, which helps infiltrate, protects our groundwater, allows the water to be clean before it gets to any destination that it might travel to. It's gonna be lower maintenance once it grows, and it's gonna take a couple years for the plants to, to fill in the, the mulch space, but other than that, they're just gonna to have to weed. They're not gonna to have to mow or irrigate it to the same extent that they would if it was green grass. It'll take more like five to eight years for the trees to get really big and robust. It should look really full. We probably won't be able to see through it. Depending on the size of the living fence, the South Washington Conservation District will reimburse homeowners up to $3,500 each. The district's Clean Water Cost Share Program also provides financial incentives for shoreline buffers, rain gardens, and other eco-friendly plantings. It's well worth the investment. Just one pound of phosphorus removed from stormwater runoff can prevent up to 500 pounds of algae growth. 
The living fence can also turn a backyard into a learning experience for children, like Emma and Jack. They really love it. We've loved watching it go in and watch the plants grow, and we go and we weed it, and we talk about the different plants and what's not a weed and what's a plant, and they like it. The City of Woodbury takes sustainability and water conservation very seriously. One of the things that the city is really excited about is that this is being implemented in the 21 Oaks development, which is one of our nicer developments with high attention to detail throughout the development. And if it can be implemented within this development, we feel confident that we'll be able to find other locations throughout the city. If you have the opportunity to do something like this, it, it's just really, it was a really easy, I, there was no pain points, it was simple, and the end result really Hopefully in a few years will just be beautiful. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Grand Stay Hotels, featuring 35 hotels in eight states and growing. Every guest, every time with Grand Stay. More on the web at grandstayhospitality.com. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Live Wide Open, telling stories of why people have chosen to live wide open in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. just float from Granite Falls to downtown St. Paul. And that's extremely unique for a river near a metro area because so many of our rivers are dammed and have dangerous obstructions that paddlers especially need to look out for. But the Minnesota River provides a very unique opportunity to paddle over 200 miles without having to get out of your canoe.